Hi, in this short talk, we're going to talk about Introduction to Geography. This is meant to complement my online GI Introduction to GIS 2020 Online 1 course. But you can follow along for any of the courses that I teach here. You'll see here in this course, we're going to talk about GIS. GIS is the study or the technology by which we basically express geography. When we talk about what GIS is, GIS isn't a GPS system. It isn't just one particular software package, although we're going to be working with one so software package. It's not a map. Typically, our map's going to be the end product. And GIS is a system. It's hardware, software, data, and personnel, you guys particularly, and doing the techniques so we can manipulate, analyze, and present spatial information that's tied to spatial location. We'll talk about the differences between those. When we look at the components of a GIS, most components that we talk about are the people and the procedures. Okay? They make up, or the people and the data and the procedures that go about making the actual maps. Okay? We need resources to pay people and resources to resources and people to make data. Software and hardware are very minor uh, minor components to it. You can see here what we're looking at. It's hardware software, the actual computer that we're working on, the software that we're going to be working with, and a lot of our course is going to be a lot of pointing and clicking. A lot of pointing and clicking. And we're going to be doing on different types of data. The book is going to present some data in which you go through and do an exercises. And then in our course, what we're going to do later is work with data that's germane to the Dur uh, Durham community. So we're going to work with crime data, census data, history data, lots of different types of data because GIS can be used in a lot of different professions and disciplines. And then we'll talk about the methods. We're going to look at things called queries and map creation. As we get more advanced, we'll do things called geocoding and network analysis. When we talk about geography, the one common theme about geography is that it involves the spatial extent. A geographer cares about how things are expressed across the surface of the Earth. Here's an example of Human Development Index. This is just one of the measures that we work with here to look at how, quote unquote, good a country is. But if you think about it, most, most disciplines, but if you think about it, most disciplines are going to need geographers. Where we're going to build the next McDonald's? Where are most of our clients if we're a social worker? Okay. If we are a religion major, or uh, looking at religious studies, where is a particular religion located across the surface of the Earth or the United States? So a lot of different disciplines are going to care about where these are. When we talk about GIS, there's a lot of related technologies. It intersects with CAD, which is computer-aided design, but it's a little bit older. Um, database ma um, database applications, statistical an analysis systems. I know social work majors have to take a quantitative analysis course. GPS, which we all have it within our phones, and remote sensing systems, which is taking data from a distance. Basically, GIS is the way that we can express geography, way that we can analyze the where component that we talked about before. And GIS and geography in particular has five main themes. We have location. Okay, we have absolute versus relative location, and absolute location is what we think about with a GPS. It's our latitude and longitude based on what we call the geographic coordinate system, which we'll talk about later. We have another component, which is our human environment interaction. Our department is environmental earth and geospatial sciences. So how do we do things to the earth to make sure we're not screwing it up for future generations, whether it's water quality, soil quality, where is this happening? And where is this happening? Is sustainable existence on the planet an achievable reality, or is environmental damage the inevitable, inevitable consequence of human settlement? So how do we keep the Earth around for future generations? Okay, you can see an example here. You can see this is the salt in the sea down in Southern California here. And you can see what's going on here. This red area shows farmland in the middle of the desert. Obviously, that wasn't that hasn't been there for the whole time. So what are the long-term exacerbating consequences of this? We have the whole idea of region, the whole concept that typical pl typically things or features are going to be concentrated in certain areas. We, we live in one of these, okay? Research Triangle area. Okay, we have got Durham, Chapel Hill. It's a center for pretty much anything that you want, any type of doctor, any type of university, any type of high tech, okay? So people are going to conglomerate there. 
And you can see an example here that I have. In the bottom right here, I was looking at the whole idea of crime mapping. Okay? I, did, I used to do a lot of crime mapping where I used to work. And you can see in the top right, you can see a map that has clusters of high crimes. And you can see in the bottom, from 2005 to 2007, it actually moved. That cluster, that red area, moved from north to south. Kind of interesting. Okay, and more importantly, we're going to lean on subject subject matter experts like you guys to figure out why that is. Okay, whether it's our sociology folks or our social work folks or our public health folks to figure out why these patterns exist. Another we have is place. Another we have is movement, the movement of goods and features. Typically, this is how we look at data. Okay, and in your quantitative analysis courses that you're probably taking, you work with spreadsheets and you work with lots of numbers. Okay, these are crime events for Winston-Salem in 2006. Each one that reads across is called a record, and we'll talk about this later. But this is what we want to look at here. Okay, so we really extend the capabilities of our information systems to a spatial component. So now, these are all of the homicides that have occurred here. Okay, are they close? What time of day did they occur at? So we have, are they near parks? What is the income of this area here? So you can see with GIS, we have a lot of extended capabilities that we don't have with these information systems. Okay, typically 75% of all data has some sort of spatial component. Okay, whether it's just a list of your patients at a doctor's office. Okay, we can stick them on a map and see where they're coming from and where they're going to. Typically, when we talk about data, there's just tons and tons of data out there. You're producing it on a regular basis. Whenever you go to a checkout and you scan your card at Food Lion or Lowe's or whatever, they're collecting information about where you are, what you're buying, and a lot of times that can be put into a GIS. Typically, when we talk about GIS, a lot of people think the end product is creating maps like this. We can look at median housing, median housing prices by county for the state of Maryland here. That's typically the end product of what analysis we're looking at. This is more of a general reference map. This is called a digital raster graphic image here for um, Vermont here. And some of you might have worked with these in earth science or physical geography classes, or maybe even the paper version of these like I did back in oh, just a long time ago. You can see here, here are tornadoes. Okay, we know that there's an area in the central U.S. called Tornado Alley. You can see by county, you can see the number of tornadoes that occurred between 1950 and 1996. And this is what we call a choropleptic map, meaning we color in the counties or enumeration units based on the value there. Okay, and there's some advantages and disadvantages of these maps, but I won't get into that now. Typically with GIS, we store, manipulate, and manage data in the form of tabular data structures, okay? I'll use the term Excel a lot, but any sort of spreadsheet management system that we can work with. And then with GIS, we can do things like overlay, buffering, and networking. Okay, here are some earthquake uh, former, I think these might be volcanic features in the Pacific Northwest, and we're making a buffer area around them to see areas that should be evacuated first in the event of a uh, eruption. Okay. Here are tornadoes at point location, so these are the latitudes and longitudes of all tornadoes that have occurred. And we're looking here at Camp Atterbury and Fort Knox, so we're looking at in the northern part, we're looking at Indianapolis, all the way down to Louisville. In the upper right here, we're looking at, this is Cincinnati up here. Okay, so you can see, there's a lot of points here, a lot of data here. Okay, you can really get, kind of get lost in it. And I can kind of parse it down a little bit to these kind of buffer regions around these army installations that I was looking at here. Okay. When we look at a GIS, we can see these things are, are layered on top of each other. So it can get really ugly really quickly if you don't know what you're talking about. And you started to see what we looked at before. We had army installations, we had cities, we had that buffer, we had all that point. So those things can get pretty ugly pretty quickly. When we also we talk about GIS, we use it to make decisions about any sort of problem with a spatial element. Here I looked at a ba uh, baseball suitability s um, map for greater Spokane area. And we used a number of different criteria, access to highways, access um, the type of zoning it is, how close it was to existing uh, rail lines so people could have easy access to them. Okay, I used to work for the military and we wanted to build training maps. Okay, we wanted to build a training area at Fort Bragg or Fort Stewart or some big military installation and we had about eight to ten different criteria that we wanted to take into account. We wanted to see, is it close to a road? We don't want to build new roads. 
Is it near endangered species? We didn't want to disrupt them. Uh, are we going to fire weapons into swamps or anything like that? Because it, we didn't want to have groundwater contamination. We need it near elect existing electrical lines because we didn't want to have to build all new utilities. So there were some natural factors as well as some infrastructure factors that we had to take into account with those. So you as social works might have to figure out where am I going to stick a community center? Well, we're going to stick it where there's the most need for it. Well, how do we define need? And those are going to be some of the criteria that you determine yourself. This is the type of hardware we have. I'm not going to get too much into this, but this is a big server computer. This is going to be the software that we're going to be looking at here. And then we can talk about different applications. How, where can something be built? We just had a new McDonald's built right across the street from my daughter's elementary school. Do you think that's coincidence? I don't think so either. Okay, average community time commuting time, what's the best route between two places, where do habitats coincide. So you can see some of these are going to intersect with the social sciences, others not so much. It's a valuable tool for organizing health outcome data, environmental exposure, and displaying research results. Okay, one of the things that I do is I'm more into the social sciences, health outcomes. This is called the snow map of 1854. This is one of the first uses of GIS, where someone mapped a cholera outbreak, 600 cholera deaths. Okay, and you can see where they are here. Okay, you can see where they are here, and then these dots right here show me water pumps, and then that red water pump right in the middle here, this is the water pump. They just removed the handle, and after a little while, that started to leave, um, the death stopped happening. So there was a contaminated water pump here. Other things that we have are, are cancer mortality rates that we can look at. You can see it's really high here through Kentucky and West Virginia here. Coal mining. Other things, we have neighbor, neighborhood walkability. Okay, we can look at contour lines to see which is the most walkable neighborhood. Uh, we can look, start to look at multivariate data. So we can look at lead exposure versus the year that the house was built. So these d yellow dots here mean these yellow dots here mean we have the highest number of cases by uh, highest number of lead poisoning cases versus the median age that the year was built. So you can start to see that older homes have more cases of lead poisoning. Uh, we have income. This is for Fourth Size County. Darker the area, the more. The lighter the area, the less. This is for income here. Um, this is median household income. Hopefully you guys know what median means. Um, this is female age graded cancer mortality rates. This is a lot to go through, but we'll talk about what those mean. And this is male. So this is female. This is male. You can see the differences. We'll talk about why. Um, this is visualization, so we can kind of make some cool stuff, 3D renderings. This is Salt Lake City. This is, a, uh, this is what we call a remotely sensed image. We stick it on top of some 3D data, and we can neat, make some neat things that look like this. We can look at change detection analysis. What has changed before and after? And that doesn't have to be physical data that we're looking at here. It could be crime data. Okay, what's the crime rate in a neighborhood before and after? Let's look at it for a whole neighborhood, a whole city's worth of neighborhoods. Where's crime gone down? Where's crime got up? Gone up? Okay, merely subtracting them. Okay, and you can see these. These are in Sumatra, um, between the um, Boxing Day tsunami in 2004. And then this is remotely sensed data. This is data taken from an airplane or satellite here. And then we can start to compare our points, lines, and polygons, our GIS data. You can see right here, okay, points, lines, and polygons with our other data. And then we can query things too. Okay, where are things, how many of these, and overlays. We can look at distances, how far around something do we want to have. And then typically our end product is going to be graphs, charts, tables, or a combination of the two.